Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to another special edition of Rethinking Faith. It's been a little bit of a while since we've done this. Um, I'm one of the hosts. If this is your first time checking us out, I'm one of the hosts, Mitch. The guy with the New York hat on down there, whether, whether you see him to my left, bottom, or to the right, is Mr. Ray Luke. Um, most of you know Ray. Ray and I have done... Um, have done broadcasts before, have done shows before, but today we're going to do a conversation with a uh, a gentleman that uh, I'm going to introduce Ty to you. Um, his actual full name is Tyrone Nichols, but I get to call him Ty because I'm older than he is, okay? <laughs> but um, I want to say before I let Ray kind of do the formal introduction, um, Ty, that in this conversation today, I feel so blessed that you are here with us and that you are out on the West Coast. Ray is down in Miami. I'm outside of Atlanta. Um, I do have my Celsius, okay? And, uh, <laughs> and that's the commercial uh, for the moment there. But I, I've been looking forward to this, and I know Ray has two tie for a long time. And... Uh, the space that the space that we sit in, I think you are becoming a force to be reckoned with. I think you are, um, um, you know, Ray. Ray goes back and forth between the real deep things that he's able to work with, but he also keeps a level of conversation that that challenges those of you know those of us who. I don't want to say are still making our way out of Christianity, but who are still, you know, becoming, trying to become educated yeah. to the truth. Yeah. And so I want to say that uh, I'm honored to have you here today on the, uh, on the podcast. And uh, just uh, like I said, I know we've tried to, to get this together a couple of times, but um, it's really a blessing, like I said, to have you here. And, uh, and to finally get to meet you like this, you know, that, um, uh, but, uh, I'm gonna let Ray, I'm gonna let you just go ahead and do a, a, a quick introduction on him too. And then Ty, when he does, if you'll just give us a really nice Polaroid for those of you that are my age, understand what that is, uh, a snapshot of, of, of your, of your educational background and kind of where he came from. And then we're going to jump into the the topic um that concerns two words that like i i have said before ray knows this and ray is very um passionate about it too and there they are the terms that we hear it's called replacement theology and then also anti-semitism mm -hmm. and in today's culture in today's world they are as strong as ever. Yeah. And so uh, with the work that you're doing, not only uh, in the book that you've written, which I'm going to link in the comment section once we get done with this, and uh, also what you're doing in getting out, you're on the front line. Hmm. We have a lot of these discussions back and forth in groups but you're actually going out there and you're actually putting your shoes on and you're getting into the environments that I just, you know, I think it's amazing. I just think it's amazing and it's what we need. So without further ado, I'm going to let Ray because he's able to grow the beard and, you know, he's <laughs> got the hat and all that. But Ray, if you'll give him a big, you'll give him a big thumbs up. We'll get this thing started, man. Uh, so once again, man, uh, appreciate you guys. Uh, we want to thank God for this opportunity, first and foremost. And then, you know, uh, me and Mitch have been doing this for quite a bit of time. Um, we were doing it with another guy who's very special with us as well, and that's James Ballard. Um, yeah. We have all kind of been in the same circle for a while. Um, I, I remember James is very similar to Ty, uh, to our guest today and, and, and a dear friend. He, he's been on Beit Midrash for a while, but you, you would never know it. Um, Beit Midrash is it's like a study group that we have together. And um, it's been around for as long as I can think. I've been on 
Facebook maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of my, a lot of my old friends, we've been together for maybe like 14, 13 to 14 years. And so that group has really helped many, many people. James Ballard used to be on there and wouldn't say a word. And then he started messaging me privately. Mm. And that's how we met. Mm. Uh, me and James have been friends for many years now. And, uh, you know, we would have private messages and I, and I would I would speak to him. and I would be like, you know, this guy knows his stuff, you know. And I never knew that he knew what he all of what he did know until we started doing uh, shows together. Um, me, Mitch and, and James and James was remarkable. I mean, he's incredible. Yeah. And now he's kind of doing his own thing, has kind of developed. And, um, you know, he, he brings so much good stuff. And so yeah. with, I said all that to say that Ty is very similar. Uh, I met Ty in a very similar fashion. I believe it was through Bay Midrash as well. And he too would just be lurking, you know, uh, behind the scenes here and there. And then we started speaking to Messenger as well. And very similar, like you hear about people's backgrounds and, and the similarities. Uh, most of us, even like James and Mitch, we were in the, in the Christian world and were Christians for a very long time. And when I say we're Christians, I mean, I, I don't mean it in a derogatory way. I mean, a lot of things have changed because of the awakening or the realization that we have had that many people too, we're trying to bring this realization and this understanding to people. And that is that, that your book is called Ty, Jesus is Jewish. And, yeah. and when we say Jesus is Jewish, that means the world, that means a lot. It, it changes a lot to us. And it, 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 when you have this, this realization, you can't go back on it. And so Ty is just one of these people that is prepared. Um, and what I mean prepared is he's a guy who has a, a his education. Um, he has gone through lengths. You know, he was in the Christian world and learned a lot. You know, we know the theology. Uh, we know the, the ABCs. And then he, too, started having little by little. Um, little things that didn't make sense, little things that weren't being answered correctly. Um, and that plunges you into a deep dive into, you know, some self-doubt and doubt. And and the more you research, the more you know, because a lot of times in Christianity, you know, I had the same thing happen to me is that, you know, I would have a certain doubt on a question or something. And when I would ask them, when I would ask, it was like more of like a, you know, shoe answer you know it wasn't it wasn't something sufficient and it only sent me into uh researching it more yeah and this is what happened to a lot of guys like ty and so ty man i mean ty me and ty have a lot of uh, similarities as well i mean i played basketball and he as well coached coached at a high level uh what was the school you coached at again ty uh, I was an assistant coach at Liberty University in Virginia for five or six, Liberty. four or five right. years, something like that. And oh, then um, I, I didn't know a, that. I, yeah, I took <laughs> a uh, head coaching job in Los Angeles at Sierra Canyon High School, and we kind of yeah. had a great wow, run. man. And they're still doing well. Actually, the my associate head coach is now the head coach at Sierra Canyon. Mm. Incredible, yeah. man! Incredible. That's yeah. a good school. That's a real good school. Yeah. Man, you went you oh, went across yeah. the nation. You you went from Virginia to California. That's two different, two different oh, yeah. scenarios, man. That's and cool. where you, where are you originally from, Ty? Well, my dad was. Uh, my parents were uh, full time missionaries with Campus Crusade for Christ, mm -hmm. and my dad was the head coach and general manager of Athletes in Action, the basketball team that would play against universities and Olympic teams around the world and share their faith mm -hmm. at halftime. And oh wow! So wow. because of that. Uh, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the gym. First of all, I, I'm a basketball rat. I would spend eight to 10 weeks every summer at summer camp. Uh, and then I got to see some of the most beautiful universities and meet the most amazing people because of my dad's job. Hmm. Uh, but anyways, I say all that to say I was born in Portland. We moved to Indianapolis, Indiana, moved to Vancouver, Canada, moved to San Diego, California when I was a sophomore because they were going to build a campus for Campus Crusade for Christ in San Diego and we arrived in San Diego and I was like, dad, look, you can move again, but I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm staying here the rest of my life. This place is wow. just gorgeous. And so wow. I consider San Diego home. It's where I met my wife. 
Patty at a little, little small church. I was a worship leader at a really small church. I was talking with Mitch earlier about setting mm -hmm. up and taking down every day and getting the U-Haul out there and moving the chairs. And so, <laughs> you know, we had a lot of similar experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. But so then my very first head coaching job, I was at Vista High School in San Diego. And I went from Vista to uh, Liberty University in Virginia. But the the key for the jump to Division One wasn't necessarily the high school; it was the AAU scene. We were sponsored by Nike. We had one of the Nike traveling teams. Wow! We built wow. a fifty six thousand square foot facility in San Diego with six full basketball courts. Wow! We held wow. national events. Yeah, it was. I was all in <laughs> in that world. <clears throat> so that's incredible, man. Yeah, <clears throat> that's incredible. Now, Ty, tell us, uh, tell us, tell us a little bit of your background or how you got to the understanding that you are in today? Yeah, sure, Ray, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say that, Ray, you are one of the people that I've, I, I constantly look to for sourcing material. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget uh, driving out. I, I go to, <clears throat> I used to go to this uh, gun range called Front Sight in in uh, Nevada for two or three days. And we'd go out there and we, I'd, I wanna make sure that I'm always weapons proficient all the time. And front sight was the best place to do it. But, you know, it's a four or five hour drive for me. Hmm. And this was early. I think it was early when I was deciding, you know what, I need to go get my master's of divinity in this thing. And just having this long convert and you would take time, you long conversations about really deep stuff, like <laughs> conversations that I didn't know you could have. Hmm. I didn't know you could have conversations like the conversations we were having. And it was, it was thrilling. It was exciting. It was motivating. It was mm. depressing. It was <laughs> discouraging. Yep. Yep. It was made me angry. Um, but I just, I just want to say publicly, I just thank you for your consistency over all these years. Yeah, mm. I am a lurker and I do evaluate men by their word. And, and I see over time, whether or not they remain consistent because people of character stay. People with no character, they don't stay. They kind of fizzle out over time. And the, yep. the 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 cracks in the foundation begin to show. But for as long as I've yep. I, I've known you and Mitch, I've just recently gotten to know you. You you have been a just such a huge mm -hmm. encouragement uh to me, just through all of it, just your flat out consistency and commitment to what I like to call the pursuit of truth. Right. And the pursuit of truth consists of an unwavering commitment to the following statement. Whatever I believe that isn't true, I'm willing to discard. Mm -hmm. And whatever is true, I'm willing to hold on to no matter what. No matter what. And there are very few was... people who are mentally uh, strong enough to do that. It's really a yeah. hard, most people think they are, but yeah. when you actually get down to it, it's very few people are, and, and, and you're one of them. And so I just want you to know, I appreciate that. Oh, Ty, that means, uh, that means a lot to me, man. Honestly, um, you know, some of my closest friends and some of my best friends have been people that I have met in this journey. Some people that I've never even met. Uh, face to face, uh, Mitch. I, Mitch is one of my closest friends, and we just recently met not too long ago. And we wow. have been friends for years. Uh, same thing with you, James. Some of my closest friends are not people that I see on a day to day basis. Uh, what you said is something that I've tried to live throughout my my life. I mean, not perfect, but definitely, uh, as the sages say, a life of tshuva, a life of 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 repentance, right? We make mistakes, or like the proverbs say, you, you know, you, you you fall seven, you fall seven times, you get up, you get up, you know, you get up eight. Um, and this is how I tried to model my life. I said, you know, as a competitor, because I was deeply into basketball. Basketball was everything to me, um, and I literally gave it my all. And so, and I got far. I got to play professionally. And what I said when I came to my revelation if you would say everyone has a, a moment with god and i i came to that moment i i guess that moment of the the burning bush mm -hmm. and i had a choice to make and i said if i gave my all you know to something so transitory like you know sports or playing basketball i literally gave it everything how much more so 
to the realization that I, I'm having right now with God, with the creator. Yeah. I'm going to give it even more. Right. Mm. And so one of my prayers, even as a long time as, as I was a Christian, was this. I would pray it every day. I still pray it to this day. And I would say, God, no matter how hard the truth is, um, let me follow it. Yeah. No matter what I believe, if it's not the truth, help me to discard it. Yeah. And wherever the truth may lead, help me to follow it. Yeah. It's something that I've always prayed to this day. And and it was tough, man. You know, um, I remember defending certain things because of the way that I was taught, right? Mm -hmm. And it is okay. I mean, I, I say this all the time. Within Christianity, there's it's not that there's bad people. Everyone loves God and they're trying to do their best. I was in, I was right there. I was doing the same thing. Um, but some things were just not, you know, <clears throat> it wasn't taught to us. There's something that they do to people in seminary. You know, they, they, they teach them something that's actually not part of the history. Yeah. Um, th there's, there's, you read the new Testament, you think you, you're, you're listening to Christianity, but what you're reading in the new Testament is a history separated from Christianity. Christianity yeah. is something that I tell people all the time. It came about 250, 300 years later, um, not actually during the, the days and the times of what you're reading in the New Testament. That's right. something totally different. And so the I had never read anything about, I had never read the church fathers for myself. You know, I had never read any of these things. And I think that the majority of Christians in the pews have never have neither. Um, Agreed. So I it is, it is. Yeah, I, I had neither. So I think it's I think it's the responsibility of every well-meaning and loving Christian because I've been in, in, in churches and people don't do love God and want to do right. But there's there's a fear. There's a fear of falling out of grace with God for believing the wrong things. Yeah. And these are some of the some of the topics that we deal with, as I'm All sure you're aware. All the time. You know, you bring up so many good points, Ray. The my, I am so thankful for my uh, upbringing. I was, a, I was a missionary's kid, right? Mm -hmm. It yep. introduced me to the God of the universe, the source of all sources. The, yes. <laughs> and I, I don't know where I'd be without that, that understanding, that, that beginning, that yep. hashkafa, right? That we call in it, this worldview. Yep. And all of the people that are in my sliver of, of Christendom. Right, and I'm my sliver of Christendom. Let's call it uh, non-denominational evangelical Christianity. Right, I was in, I was, I had, I under, I went to some Mennonite places, some Baptist places, Southern Baptist, and about you know, I had some smatterings that go going up in the church, but I most identify with the non-denominational evangelical Christian world. Yep. And in, yep. and in that world, the people that I know follow the two greatest commandments. They love God and they love people to the best of their ability and to the best of knowledge by far. Uh, and I'm so thankful that I was surrounded by a group of people who love God and love people. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> what happens sometimes when we get into these theological conversations, which I know we'll talk about some today, and is... What's happened to the institution of Christianity? Okay, when I say the institution, I'm talking about universal Christendom, which encompasses all 45,000 different denominations of universal Christendom, according to Google. I don't know how yep. Google got that number, but it's pretty big. And I can kind of yep. figure it out in my mind, so we can too. So when I say the institution of Christianity or universal Christendom, that's what I'm talking about. When most people hear me think the talk, they, they think I'm talking about to their sliver. I'm not talking about your sliver. Your sliver is such a small piece of the whole pie here yeah. <laughs> that we need to think about this thing in really broad terms, right? Hmm. But what's happened historically within universal Christianity is that we have elevated theology above the, the, the first two commandments. And when we take theology and we elevate it above the first two commandments, that's when we get splits. That's when we get fights. We killed each other over this stuff yep, yep. in history, right? So oftentimes I'll say, look, if ever our conversation gets to the point 
where our theology is being elevated above the two greatest commandments. I don't want any part of it. I don't want to be in the conversation. I'd rather just bow out. You can do it. You can think and believe and understand God and however you want to understand it. It's cool. I would rather love you as a brother and love God as a brother than get into some kind of fight over some really hard stuff. This is really hard yeah. theology that if it's not handled with the utmost care, I, I like to think of it as white gloves, then then I think we're doing God, a dis, I think we're doing a disservice to the community uh, if theology all of a sudden becomes the highest priority in the way yep. in which we practice our faith, right? So, yep. so in light of that, where do we go to talk about theology? That we all end up in this place where no one is able to find us. I'm going to call it a safe space. I hate that word, but I don't know what other you to use the word to use. Where do we find a safe space to talk about the very difficult theological ideas that are presented within the the, the entire canon of Scripture? When when we create a space where every question you can't ever ask every question. Like, like, for instance, when I when I teach in, in the studies, I'll say, look, that we have two rules. One, we're going to love each other. We're going to walk out of here loving each other. And number two, there's no question that's out of bounds. None. Not one question out of bounds. Now, I might not know the answer. And if I don't, I'll tell you, I don't know. But that's a great right. question. If, if people feel comfortable to be able to ask, just ask the question. Then exactly. All of, right. Then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. the 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 tenseness, the intensity, the angst that comes with, oh, my gosh, am I able to ask this question about theology or am I not able to ask this question? Where can I do that? To, to create that kind of space, I think, for me anyway, and, and I think we're right now where God has me is it's, it's really important for for there to be an environment where those who love God and love people, I'm going to call those people Torah followers. That's a term yeah. that they would never use in Christianity, but that's exactly what that is. It's Torah exactly. following, right? Exactly. Those Torah followers, those people who love God, they, they just need a space to be able to breathe. <sighs> okay, I'm safe here. I can ask this. And yeah, the second, because the conscious, yeah. the conscious of Christians for a very long time has been kind of seared with that fear that it's still there. Oh, yeah. uh, that question is is a no no to ask. They they yeah. a lot of people still think that way. Yes, definitely. Let, let me um just real yeah. quick. One of the things that um, by the way, everything that Ty said about E Ray, um, I I piggyback off that because you, you know your influence on me. Not just in the theological realm of thinking, but in my and just in personal life, um, to to have somebody like you in my life has been um, a stable block. So my appreciation for for you, you know where that goes. Okay, um, the, what I want to say with with Ty is that for those of you that are watching out there. Um, it's one thing to go on a maybe a Facebook forum or a social media forum and to make a statement and then have comments come in and then respond and so forth like that. I'm I'm watching Ty go into being invited into the church, into an environment where knowing that he is about to He's about to unnerve some thought patterns, okay, and do it in a way where he ends up with more questions coming back at him than he does with the deliverance of answers, which is what we need. And that's that space I think you're talking about, Ty, where um, I'm seeing that with you, with your your ability, like I said, whether it's connections or or – how you're able to do it, but I've watched you through several of the recordings of you going into whether it's a men's ministry, a women's ministry, um, 
<clears throat> or just an or just an interview, you are providing that space for the questions to be to be asked because you can't ask those questions in, in a service on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. and you can't ask them if somebody's already got a Sunday school lesson prepared. You can't ask or them the, right like a lecture. You can't ask them if it's a. You can't ask it if it's a lecture. But what the yes. space that Ty has created is a is a is yes. a space that is back and forth. Yes. Yeah. It's it's yeah. it's a class. You're gonna learn. Yes. You know, we're learning together. Yeah. And when you create that safe space, which Ty has created, we've watched the videos. Um, um, people feel comfortable. And what I've always said, I cannot come to you or a group or a person, and I'm going to lecture you and teach you. The guards and the walls go right up. Uh, it's just normal human nature. But the moment we begin to have a relationship and we begin to know each other because we go to the same class over and over and over again, I get, you get to know me, I get to know you. There's, there's, there's a relationship building. Yeah. You, you gain trust and we're here together. We've yeah. always talked about this. This is yeah. the way it should be. Um, yeah. That's what discipleship actually is. OK, that's that's what it is. We, 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 we build a relationship. We get to know each other and we build trust and we begin to learn together, yeah. you know, and this is totally. something that we have we've been missing for a very long time within Christianity. Yeah, right. And that and that's why, Ty, what you're doing is the spark of discipleship of the truth. Hmm. You're, you're igniting a spark. Under the umbrella of discipleship. That eventually leads to the truth, and that's what we need today more than a bullhorn or more than um, you know some, <clears throat> some stupid argument on on a social media platform. We need more people like you and what you're doing, yeah. and getting that because I watch you allow questions to come back, and you have a little bit more patience than I would have responding back to some of those. And a little bit more patient than I know Ray would have uh, responding back to some of those. But you do a great job with that, man. Well, I great job. It. I do. I, I, I love, and I know we all do, I, I love the people in the church. It's the soil from which my soul decided to take yep. its journey, right? Yep. And so I want to honor that decision if you if you believe that way as far as you know your soul's existence before birth which i do and you know i like to think about the idea that my soul accepted this mission from hashem from god and said yeah you know what 19 you know whenever whatever year i was born that geez i can't remember when i was born that's crazy i'm 54 so whatever year that is <laughs> Uh, my soul said, you know what, look, you're going to be born to Arlie and Fern Nichols in Portland, Oregon. You're going to be raised in uh, a beautiful, loving home with a loving family that's um, has a deep Christian roots. I mean, guys, my mom is, she is uh, the founder and president of Moms in Prayer International, which is the largest women's prayer ministry, I think, in the world. They're like in 160 w. different countries, right? <laughs> Wow. So these, that, that's my tribe will always be that. Yeah. Yep. It's my tribe. It's what I chose yep. before I started. Yep. So the last thing I want to do is, is introduce what we're calling the truth. And I want to go back to this, this idea what we're all calling the truth here is introduce this truth exactly. to my tribe in a, in a way in which I don't want them to choke. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I want them to actually be fed with the nourishment that exists within the canonized text that we have in a way that's so palatable that it tastes good mm -hmm. it's like yep. oh my gosh that i actually feel full after yep. having these conversations right so that's that's kind of the, the way in which i i see my role in this this my teeny teeny role in this whole thing of let's call it pursuing truth so, yes, sir. So let's talk about that just for a second. What is truth, right? What is pursuing truth? And there are all different ways in which the world has said to us to pursue truth. For me, my understanding of truth is the title of my book, which is Jesus is Jewish. 
I thought about all kinds of different things to title it. I could have said Jesus was Jewish or the Galilean or the man from Nazareth. But none of those titles actually communicated the profundity of the idea that Jesus is Jewish. Yep. I had a guy ask me one time, how do you fill 350 pages of a book about the idea that Jesus is Jewish? Isn't that like kind of a, like a no duh? Don't we all understand that Jesus is Jewish? I'm like, <laughs> well, maybe, but he's Jewish. <laughs> right? And then every time it's like, well, what do you understand that I don't understand? Right. And it just, Oh, it begins to yeah, open up yeah. this natural dialogue of, this Sabbath observant, Torah observant, kosher eating, halakhically sound, first century, as you would use the term, Ray Hasid, right? This super pious yeah. Jewish man who never violated the laws of Hashem is a completely different caricature than the one that I understood which was blonde hair, blue eyes, stained glass window, uh, the progenitor of a new religion that draws one closer to yep. God, that does away with, honors kind of the old stuff, but has done away with it because we're in this new dispensation of grace and love. And right. So when I start to put that caricature together of the way I, I viewed Jesus, when I came across the idea that he was Jewish, it was like, huh, I, I didn't know that. That's the tr yeah. truth, right? I didn't know that. I didn't even yeah. know his, I didn't even know he had a Hebrew name. I didn't know his <laughs> yep. name was Yeshua. Mm -hmm. So, yep. so anyways, so taking it all back to this idea of this conversation we'll have today about this, this pursuing truth. For me, a big piece of this pursuing truth is really taking a deep dive into what does it mean that that Jesus is Jewish? Why did Matthew take the first chapter of his book to give us his lineage? All right, it's more than just prophecy. It's setting the context and the culture with which we need to understand this man. And if we don't, yeah, yeah. we're actually reading a different story. Honestly, we're just reading a different deal. Yep. <laughs> and I'm yep. like, ah, I, I don't I don't want to read that deal. I want to know about the guy that that's actually written about in those pages. So for me, that's the pursuit. And it's gonna be a lifelong journey. But that 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 truth, man, that truth is so powerful. Uh Ty, me, Mitch, James, we've talked about this. And I've said it various times, you know, I, I drive through my neighborhood and it, you guys can do the same. And I'll get to a, the end of the block and there's going to be a church there with the cross. And these people follow, like you say, a caricature. But the symbolism, what's behind this, this Jesus and this cross, this is a religious Jewish man. When I say, when we say Jesus is Jewish, if you want to get down to the facts, the hardcore historical truth true facts behind it is that and this is what i as a christian did not know he is a religious jewish man yeah. not a christian i have to say it this way because in the christian mind the way my mind works and i have interviewed and spoken to various christians and i'll and you'll say to him right duh he's jewish duh. you know jesus is jewish duh he's jewish yeah he lived in israel they still don't get it OK, so now I'm going to hit you with it. OK, he was not a Christian. He did not think like you and I as Christians. OK, um, he was a religious Jew and that changes everything. What we are going to do with those facts is up to you. Some people want to bury their heads in the sand. They don't want to hear it, but there's no way of getting around it. There's no way of getting around the fact that this this man uh, from the Galilee, is a religious Jew within Judaism. Mm -hmm. He didn't think like 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 uh, uh like Christians of the fifth century, or the sixth century, or the third century. He didn't think like any of them. He has more in common with the religious Jew 
at the nearby Orthodox synagogue than he does with the majority of Christians. And I mean, by faith, by language, by culture, uh, by, by beliefs. And when I say beliefs, beliefs and action within uh, the Hebrew biblical context go hand in hand. Yeah. Hand in yeah, I've thought about this a lot. Obviously, I thought about this a lot, and we, we, we talk. We talk, there's there's several levels to this. Um, there's so many levels to this. Yeah. But what one of the things that, as I take a look and I say, you know, where, where do, why has why has God blessed so many people and so many families uh, within the Christian space within Universal Christendom? Uh, without knowing that Jesus is Jewish, right? We can talk about the negative parts of church history, which we need to, right? Because we need to bring that to the forefront. But there's also been beautiful souls that have emerged from within the Christian worldview and paradigm. And I've often, often had like, God, these people didn't know that Jesus is Jewish. And, and yet they exude oh. love and kindness and uh, patience and peace. And how, how is all this possible? And, and I think it's because and I, I'd be interested to think of your, see you guys' thoughts on this. But what I really think it is, is they have a genuine desire to be disciples of Jesus. Mm -hmm. A genuine desire. However they understand that, and however I understood that at the time. But what does that mean? That means to be following the heart of Torah. What is the yeah. heart of Torah, right? The heart of Torah is the way in which the master Yeshua presented it to us in Matthew 5 through 7. And in all of his teachings, he, he was able to take the, the, the first layer of Torah and go deep into its roots of the heart condition. Mm -hmm. And somehow, I think, there's a big portion of universal Christianity that's been able to grab onto the heart of many of these things, building orphanages and taking care of the widows and loving one's neighbor and do donating to the poor and creating communities of love and space where Hashem goes, that heart, that heart is what I'm after. Yep. Now, yep. now maybe, yeah, this, the, this group of people, they, they really don't understand the connectivity from Genesis to Revelation in the way in which they could. Mm-hmm. But that's a journey, right? That's a process. So each one of us that are that are on this journey, no matter where we come from, I like to, and I know you do too, because I've heard you both talk for, for years now, to just just assume the best in the other. I'm just gonna assume, yep. I'm just gonna assume the best, assume love. And when we when we start from that that mutual admiration of the divine spark that lives within both of us and we're actually pursuing god then we have so much common ground where all these barriers and all these walls they begin to they begin to melt away i'm not saying it's not it's not hard i mean shoot it was really it was brutal for me it was a hard hard journey but um uh, Keeping the keeping the the foundation of this whole thing of love and the pursuit of God, because that's what my soul desires, and that's what the other soul desires is an honest pursuit of God. Man, the walls start coming down. Definitely, man. Definitely. Well, um, Mitch and I have talked about this. You know, it's not about you know w once this realization and when this understanding falls. Okay, Jesus is a religious Jew practice his his faith is judaism okay so what do we do now you know the, the obvious que question that people have is that, also what do i do now do i become jewish everything i believe is false and it's nothing like that um we, we you know, i tend to tell people so many times uh, i tell christians themselves you keep so much of the law and you're not even aware that you do uh large portions of it uh you, you keep so much of the actual moral in the heart of the bible and but you're not aware of it only because of a way that you've been taught, or the way that I was taught as well. Um, uh, Me too. But that's okay. That 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 is fine. I and and I will say this: now that I have been what sixteen years walking, walking in in within Judaism, okay. Um, I I'll say this. I say this all the time. 
I've been in the synagogue for many, many years. And I say, it's very difficult to find people who truly, honestly have the right kavana, as said in Hebrew, kavana, uh, intentions and heart for God, the way I saw it and experienced it in Christianity. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are so many people who have that aspect right. And, and without that, it's very, very difficult to serve God as you're supposed to, mm -hmm. okay, uh, to follow him as you're supposed to. This is key. And I tell, I tell my friends all the time, no, you're not supposed to become Jewish. <laughs> I mean, the realization and the understanding, the acceptance that the fact that he is, um, is it goes a long way. Mm -hmm. It goes a long way. It begins to uh, take us in the right direction with the right perspective. Um, it's not about it's not about, you know, saying somebody's, someone's wrong and the other one's right and you have to leave this or that. It's like you said, you know, it's it's a process. Everyone is on different paths of this journey. Um, we come to certain conclusions on our own. And that's what mostly is what I tell people that I want them to do. Don't just accept my word for it or, or anyone's word for it. We have to do our due diligence. We have to do our study. We have to do our work. And it's most important um, that we keep something that there were other great rabbis in Jesus's time and other rabbis since then who have called the same thing. Jesus, he's asked, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the most important uh, mitzvah in the whole Torah? What's the most important commandment of the whole law? And he says, he says the most important law is this. You know, he, he, he says, Shema. He says, Yo, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And then he says, and, and the other one is like it, he says, you love your neighbor as yourself. When, within this is fulfilled the entire law. This does not mean that all other laws become irrelevant. It doesn't mean that, okay? What it means is that everything in the law is summed up in those two things. Everything else you can learn with time. But the whole of the law, if you want to explain it, is like this. Love God with all of your heart. And love your neighbor as yourself. If you can do these two things, everything else can come easy. And, right. Or um, with time. Yeah. Yes. I, what you're saying is very true. Uh, the only thing I would add to it, and I will tell Ty, is that the starting point is crucial. Where when I first met you, because you, you'll hear people say, uh, you know, Jesus is Jewish. Um, but what they're saying is they're following the man and not his religion, okay? But to follow the man, everything Jesus said and everything Jesus did was what, what his religion was. But what right. has happened in Christianity is they follow Paul more than they follow Jesus, but they follow Paul out of context. Out of his, they've taken they've taken Paul's Judaism away from him, and so yeah. that that was a big you know going through seminary all of my all of my studies. If you went back into what Christians call the Old Testament, it was always a survey class. Hmm. the The bread and butter classes were always the hmm. Book of Romans. You know, Corinthians, you know, the Hebrew, the ones that build, you know, that help support that foundation where that interpretation went into a translation and then that translation, you know, supported a certain belief. That, But if you backtrack that, you will see that, and it's, it's, it's what Ty said, I have known so many good, good godly christians you know you know ray i would not have my oldest daughter had it not been for a group of men from my first church you know my 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 oldest daughter's adopted if they had not handed me a check for you know 10 grand to help with the adoption process but they were there i mean it's the kind of heart you know the money the monies they give for missionary work and and things like that and in their hearts, they believe that they are disciples of Jesus and that they yep, are following, yep, yep. you know, they're, they're following 
um, you know, the best that they can. But when it comes down to, you know, opening up, you know, to, to taking notes and really getting into, you know, what does it mean to call Jesus Jewish or that he is Jewish? And that goes back to where Ty has done such a great job with that term of unfolding that term replacement theology, which also opens up the wound of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And so, Ty, if you can, if you can just kind of get begin to elaborate a little bit on the book as far as your what got you to because i will tell you this ty one of the greatest things ray ever told me when i first met him and got going on this journey with him involved was he said mitch you, you got to get out of the you got to get out of paul for a while you just got to get out of all of paul's writings for a while and you got to go back to the beginning and then you got to you got to bring context in if you don't you're always going to be confused That's good and advice. And I held that. I held. I, I. 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 I never. I didn't even go in there for two years. Did I open up any of the writings within the New Testament beyond Matthew? Hmm. And um, but if you would, Ty, begin to um, elaborate a little bit on your thoughts of replacement theology, what that looks like today, what that has done to you and your personal walk you know your personal process and uh, and then we can also talk about how that kind of plays into because you have anti-semitism with what you see on the news right now but you also have what's under the current yeah and that under the current is in the church yeah and so and they, if yes. you would please yeah wow that we could especially we, in light, uh ty especially in light of everything that's going on man with israel yeah. Uh, your book is very timely. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a lot of people in the church don't know what to do, don't know how to help or what to support or what to think. Um, and I think that, that, that these, these issues, our topics, our topic today, the topic of your book is crucial. Yeah. Yeah. So the three of us could probably do another uh, eight sessions for three hours on just this one topic. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> to try and bring it down into a um, a soundbite is going to be really difficult. So I'm just going to ask your audience yeah. to just give give us grace as we as we head into this topic because it's so deep and it's so nuanced and it's so complex uh, that uh, that I want to really make sure that we handle it with as much care as we possibly can uh, while while honoring the other, so to speak. Yes. Yes. So um, there's two ideas that come to this. The first idea that I think we, from a high level point of view, we, we and I know you know this, Ray, and I know Mitch knows this as well. So I'm really, I'm going to say this just to the audience that may have never been introduced to this idea before, but the idea is what's called anachronism. And anachronism in, in theology especially is when you take, a later developed idea in history, and it's a develop it's a theological idea that's developed later in time relative to the first century. Right. And we take we take that idea and we pull it from the 16, 17, 1800s or wherever it happened, and then we go back into the into the New Testament corpus and we jam it in there. Yep. And we, we lay it over a top of the words that were written, and it builds what I like to call theological sediment. And that theological sediment has been building over time due to anachronism. Yep. So, so what do we do with that? Well, if we don't tackle, if we don't tackle theological sediment first it will be very difficult for us to get to the roots of how anti-Semitism has been calcified into the very foundations of universal Christendom, hmm. which most people would go, you're, Beautifully you're, said. You're, there's no way, Ty, there's no way that uh, anti-Semitism has been buried into the foundations of universal Christianity. 
we love Israel. Yes, yep. we do love Israel. But because of anachronism, we don't see how universal Christianity, I, I might even argue, is the progenitor of anti-Semitism. Now, that's a bad argument because we know it's been all the way. You can get into the uh, the Tanakh and you're going to see anti-Semitic uh, No, man, we're just... What you're saying is so on point. I've I've called it by something different throughout time. I say there's a lens over the New Testament. Like I'll hear authors write a book, whether it's a Jewish man or 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 some 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 uh secular scholar, and they'll say something like this. Uh the New Testament or the words of Jesus were the cause of anti-Semitism, blah, 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 blah. They'll say it like this, and I'm reading it, and I'm saying like Really? These words the word in the New Testament or these words in, in, in Jesus' mouth um, that are on this text, they're the cause of anti-Semitism? And I sit back and I say, no, what this person is reading, what this person is, is saying, he may not even know this, is that this sediment that you're talking about is overlaid there. This text has been read in such a way that theological uh, explanation of it has been read in such a way that this is all you're hearing. The yeah. history behind it is what you're hearing, not what the text actually says, not what the historical setting and religious context of the text is actually in. That's that. That's not. They're not, they haven't gotten there. All they're hearing is the theological baggage attached to the text. This is what I say when you read the New Testament. The majority of people, what they're hearing is the theological, that sediment, that theological context coming out of it, but not yeah. the reality, the historical setting, uh, the facts behind the words. This is not what they're getting to. They're not getting there yet. And you're right. absolutely right. This is a big problem. Yeah. So what do we do about it, right? We <clears throat> and, and, it, and the problem doesn't exist just at the lay level, right? Mm -hmm. The problem exists at every institutional level within the yes. body of Christendom. Yes. I don't believe that these people that exist at every level within the body of Christendom are nefarious. Exactly. In other words, exactly. I don't believe that they're holding to these anachronistic uh, idea, theological ideas out of evil or hate. Right. Right. It is. It's. I actually did a blog, I, my blog post this morning on this is, I think you'll find it fascinating, but I go into the psychology behind why it is we view truth the way we do. I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. I don't want to get off on that rabbit trail. So, so let's, let's stay with this theological sediment idea, right? It's going to take some courageous souls, yeah, real courageous souls to go point by point and ask ourselves, okay, when, when did dispensational theology enter the timeline of Christian theology? <laughs> right? I, I think, and I, I'm not trying to disparage anyone, but I think if you would ask the body of believers in universal Christendom, most won't know. They'll just assume that dispensational theology is a part of the biblical canon from Genesis all the way through. Right? Yep. But because we don't talk about our history much, we don't know that dispensational theology was in the mid 1800s by this guy named John Darby, and he's reading his Bible and he's looking around Darby. the world and he's going, yeah. you know what? I don't see any Israel anywhere. It's mid 1800s, right? There's no Israel anywhere. But I'm reading mm. these passages in Isaiah that are saying the temple is going to be rebuilt and there's Israel and there's a, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, but that isn't, that isn't reality. So I believe the Bible is true, and I'm just I'm paraphrasing here. I don't know this is actually how he thought, but because I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, I'm saying John right. Darby is a God fearing man trying to read his Bible, figuring out all this stuff, but there is no Israel. So he comes up with this idea of dispatch, dispatch, uh, dispensational, dispensational theology, where God works with mankind in different dispensations. Yeah, because that's the only thing that makes sense to him. Nothing right. else does. Well. We live in 2024. We know that in 1948 and 49, the nation of Israel came up out of, in, into existence by sheer miracle. Now there is a yep. nation of Israel. There is a people that are resettled in the land. So we have we have the benefit of 2020 hindsight. 
we yep. can say, hang on now. This is a different, this is different than the world that John Darby was sitting in. And mm -hmm. I just give the story of John Darby only to contextualize how we should begin to view all of our theological dogmatic tenets and ask ourselves, at what point did those tenets come along on the history of Christianity, go back into that time period to see what their worldview was like so that we can correct it if it is has errancy in it, which will remove the theological sediment, allowing us to move one step closer to the source and context and culture of the, the New Testament. Does that make sense? Yes. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. So what doubt. happens then? What happens when we do this? When when we put our when we put our academic hat, hard hats on, we know that no matter what, we are connected to God. We have that faith going into this journey because it's going to be hard to do. When we put our academic hard, hard hats on, and we take courage, <laughs> take courage, and say, "All right, Lord." My sole desire is I want to be the best disciple that I can possibly be. That's it. Whatever, whatever one of these theological points are out of congruency with the message, which takes us to point number two. If we don't understand the message in its own culture and context, we'll be shooting for a bullseye that's off target right from the get-go. Yeah. So we could do all this work on removing theological sediment, but because we haven't understood the original message in its own culture and context, we end up aiming for a target that's off target. It's yep. like shooting at the rim that's five feet off. We're going to shoot air balls every time. Yep. So it's a dual track for me anyway. This is how it's it's shaped up. It's, it's a dual track of removing theological sediment that's, I'm going to call, errant. And it's also re-understanding the message of Yeshua within the context and culture of the land, the people, and the scriptures of Israel. And those two things at the same time need to, need to happen in, in my opinion, together, like at the same time. Because yep. you can do one and then this one's going to be lagging behind and you're going to be constantly running into like what Mitch said when you told Mitch, Mitch, don't do Paul for a while. Well, that was actually pretty wise because the only way Mitch understood Paul and I understood Paul and at one point you understood Paul in your life was outside of the context and culture of Judaism. Yep. So, oh my gosh, right? So this, all of a sudden when you start to peel all this stuff back, because the three of us have all been on this journey. It's like, whoa, there's a lot of work to do here. Yeah. Uh, and how do we do this while we honor one another working through all of this? Because what's the end goal? The end goal is to find the truth. The end goal is to be the best disciples that we can be of Yeshua, <clears throat> of Jesus. Well, let, me add, um, let me give you a chance to take a breather there, um, Ty. I think what you're bringing up is it's like what Ray said earlier. We are in the right time and the right space. Here are some of the arrows that we have to combat with. I would say probably 90% of a population of an evangelical church will go a lifetime without putting a theological hat on and thinking beyond what the study notes of a particular interpretation or translation or what's being given to them from a platform. Number two, the guy or the woman on the platform doing the teaching, <laughs> there are things that they have to take into account because they're not they're not dumb. You know, they're they're seeing things begin to surface, but they gotta think about their their income, their retirement, the programs that the church is involved with, the money that goes out into missionary work, 
you know, all, all of this, the, you know, just like we read the Torah, you know, yearly, they go through a cycle of teaching yearly. You know, we, you know, we have Easter coming up, which is one of the largest days in the church. The, the, you know, Mother's Day and Easter are the two largest days of, of, of the church environment. You have that, but then you also have, you know, the funding of finding of uh, educational institutions that support those. You know, whatever denomination it is, is banked on a specific. You know, you're as long as you te- as long as you write what that professor wants you to write, you're going to pass that class. But the moment you begin to push back on it then, you know, you become not a troublemaker, but you become someone that that is capable of taking that class off track. Mm-hmm. Now, with what you're doing, you're, you're, it may happen. It may happen where you get invited one day to stand on a platform in front of 2,500 people and share your thoughts like you do in a room of 25 or 30 men or 25 or 30 women. But the fact that, you know, when Ray and I will do, would do a video and we would talk about things like this, that video might get a certain, you know, small amount of views or whatever outside. But there's three or four people that are going to view that video and it's going to ignite a spark. When you go into that those class, you know, those those environments like you're doing right now. Um, I don't think any of our, I don't think all three of us have a calling to stand in front of thousands of people and try to get this message across or try to educate. I think it works better in a smaller environment where you can take questions, mm-hmm. where you can make some type of personal connection. You know that that guy that's sitting in that chair over there that's going to be there for those six weeks of this class, you, you know what he's going to ask. You know where his heart, you, he's going to ask that same question every time he's in there because that's what he's, you know, he's been grown with. Mm-hmm. But to get him to walk out of there and get him to think about Jesus is Jewish, what I've been told all my life, is out of context of of what what form of scripture he reads really says, and yeah. so I I think for us and especially for Ray and I as as we've always talked about building that bridge, looking at the arrows that we are going to get shot at us, and Ray does a much better job of deflecting those arrows than I do. Um, he's been at this quite a bit longer, but I think that's an important. Um, picture of of what i can remember and i'll say this and i'll give it back to you i can remember the day for those of you that are familiar with the church up in chicago willow creek it's a very large i think back in the day uh, in the early 2000s they were running 25 30,000 people their lead pastor bill hybels who wrote he, he made more money off his books and never accepted a salary from the church. But I remember the day that he walked out onto the platform and he told his congregation, he said, I got to apologize to you, to all of you. He said, I have grown a church that is a mile wide and an inch deep. Hmm. And he said, I can't, I can't change the rudder. I can't change the direction. Yeah. And, and I thought about that. And I thought, man, I mean, he had some other issues he had to deal with, but to make that comment to twenty-five or thirty thousand people to go home that day after hearing that, you know, it's like, okay, well, what did he mean by that? You know, and well, what was his, you know, and and I think that's, I think a lot of pastors and a lot of teachers and a lot of educators today realize that, but yeah, there are so- elements that. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Ty. No, well, I was going to say I'm going to piggyback on that. That that takes a some a sincere amount of humility, <laughs> right? Yes, it did. And I, I think this entire journey takes that level of humility. We are all fallible, 
every one of us, me included, I don't have all the answers. If I look at who I am today at 54 compared to who I was at 38, I am a different person. And it's because uh, I understand that I don't, I don't know everything. So this level of humility is so important when we embark on this journey of, of understanding that Jesus is Jewish. So the question that comes to mind is, well, what's the threat? What, what is the threat of understanding that Jesus is Jewish? And when we begin the dialogue of a simple question, do, do you want to be as good a disciple as you can be? If mm -hmm. the answer is yes, there is no more threat. Mm -hmm. If the answer is, I want to be a disciple in the context and way in which I think I understand Jesus, mm. then that's, that's a soul that hasn't yet arrived to the point where I just, I just want to be the best disciple I can be, whatever that means. That's true. That's that true. level of humility is necessary for both, for all sides. You, you were talking about the pastor earlier, right? These pastors are under a tremendous amount of pressure. They've got a mm. staff. They've got, pe they got mouths to feed. They've got a congregation yep. to build. They've been teaching for however many years it is on the way in which they've understood the Bible. And uh, the, the, I can't imagine the amount of pressure that these, these pastors are under in order to, who are they going to wrestle this with through? <laughs> Who, who are they going to turn to in order That's to right. say, you know, I was listening to these three dudes on the internet the other day and they were talking about Jesus is Jewish. And I've been wondering about that for a while. Where's that pastor going to go? Who's got 2000 members in his church that really wants to explore this idea. What's right. going to do. Right. He needs to find a space like this space where there's humble men who are in the pursuit of truth that, mm -hmm. that can come alongside him and not see this like as an instant transformation of an entire body, but a slow, gradual process of dropping little nuggets of understanding of all the beauty that comes with knowing that Jesus is Jewish. Mm -hmm. It's it's so missing. So um, I want to give a couple of shout outs. I don't know if they'll hear this or not, but there's a guy here in my town uh, his name is Rob McCoy. He's a pastor at a church, mm. very large church. I would say nationally influential. Uh, it's a Calvary chapel who came out about a year ago with a hard hitting sermon on replacement theology. I mean, he just, it was no holds barred. Mm -hmm. I, was I was shocked. I listened to it. Yeah. I, mm. I'd never heard an evangelical pastor come out replacement theology like Rob did. And then you got another guy, Jack Hibbs, down in uh, Chino Hills, California, who just recently came out with a book, and and he's beginning now to tackle replacement theology, hard. Now, I believe that the Lord is bringing this to light in in certain pastors whose denominations are all about the pursuit of knowing and being disciples of Jesus. When that's your ultimate goal, mm -hmm. then the idea of exploring that Jesus is Jewish, it's kind of like, yeah, I probably should do that because I want to be, I want to be the best disciple I can be. Yeah. Mm. So I say all that to say that I think that the three of us and those of us that listen to uh, are listening online right now, that we all need to be super sensitive to creating a space where there's somewhere someone can go, especially yeah. a pastor. Yep. To be loved. And we completely understand the paradigm through which they're coming <clears throat> to come alongside. So anyways, I, I've said enough about that. I think you hear my heart. On Mitch that. and I have discussed this many times, you know, um, we, we live during the times um, I call it the the technology of the, of the Messiah or messianic technology. We live during the times where there's such a thing as online communities or, uh, you know, there's a way of reaching people that in the past, these ways did not exist. Um, so information is traveling at the fastest 
pace that, that has ever been around. So I agree with you 100% that there needs to be definitely physical places where people can go discuss these things and, and, and have guidance and, you know, and, and, and a walk and a journey together. Um, but there are people like yourself, uh, like, like Mitch and I and, and James Ballard and others who are doing this work um, and trying to share uh, with love um, a lot of these truths, right? A lot of these truths that are, that are, that are made, that are made for us. These, mm -hmm. this context, you see, someone did the hard work and, and I'm so very uh, grateful, eternally grateful for the people who have paved the way before me. Uh, Dave Hunt used to be a mentor to me uh, from the Berean call, Christian man, passed away years ago, may his soul rest in peace. Um, you know, he was, he was someone that God put in, in my path that he was a man who loved Israel and taught on Israel big time. And this is what got me close to the Jewish people. Before then, I didn't know much of anything about the Jewish people or Israel. And that's what kind of set the stone and set me in a, in a place where all I wanted to do was study what was going on with this people. And the Bible is like 90%, 95% has to do with the Jewish people. And so, like, I needed to understand the context. I needed to understand what's going on. And so I continued to draw close. Then I met someone who rocked my world, right? With, he, 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 he was a, a very humble, a lot of humility. And he had, a, like, the right tools to set me in the right place to get me to rethink things, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to take another look. And so I did these things. Uh, I began to read it, you know, with with sensitivity. The Bible, I read it with, with more sensitivity to to listen to what was going on, to do a little bit more research. And then finally, that same guy, uh, his name is uh, um, Jonathan Bowman. And so he got me into FFC, First Fruits of Dawn. And I... <laughs> And I, when I took the, the highest sold co course, uh, the, the course of highest sold, when I took that course, it, it rocked everything in my faith. And it, and it wasn't something I was scared of. It was something that I was like, it was so amazing what I was, what I was listening to, what I was hearing, what I was, what I was seeing. And it set me on a path, man, that to this day, I'm just like so grateful. I think about those, be those days, those beginnings. And uh, it was something that totally transformed my faith for the good. It, mm -hmm. it, it made me to, to, to use a parable or teaching of the master of Jesus. It set me on a strong, on the rock, on a strong foundation of mm -hmm. which, you know, you have your times, you'll go through like, a, you know, out, out at sea, you'll have good, good, you know, good weather, bad weather, but you're always standing on a strong foundation. And that's and that and that's what we need to be. Yeah. Well, let let me um I, I want to be um respectful of time for Ty and for everybody. And as we wrap this up, and, and I I do want to um I do want to plug his book because it is it is a very strong and good um resource. <laughs> Uh, to begin to get the thinking going and to bring things to the forefront that you're not going to normally hear in other places. And so, like I said, I will put a link to the book in the comment section. And yeah. um, as we wrap this up, Ty, if you have anything you want to say in closing, and then uh, Ray, I'll let you say something before I then... Uh, um, shut this down so that uh because i'm actually starving so uh <laughs> I, <laughs> i'm just kidding just kidding but ty um go ahead if you have something you'd like to some closing remarks to sure yeah i appreciate it first of all it's a great conversation love to do it again i just love to have these kind of conversations right we need more of them uh but i want to circle back to this whole anti-semitism idea and our responsibility as as believers hmm. we there's a, there's one chat. I only deal with Christian history in one chapter in the book. And 
we have all mm -hmm. read the the darkness of Christian history, right? There's a lot of light, but there's a lot of dark. And in order to right those wrongs, in order to do tikkun, maybe to use that word for that, we, me, the Gentile, who's found faith in Hashem through the soil of universal Christendom, we got some work to do. We got some repairs to make. The only way we can make those repairs is if, is if I, a Gentile within the confines of universal Christianity, which is where God brought me to him, let's say that, I have to, I, I see it as incumbent upon me to right those historical wrongs as a part of my responsibility. The first way to do that is to, number one, acknowledge them and not mm. bury them, which is what, what most of us, at least I didn't, I didn't even know my Christian history. I didn't know the church history and the 325 and all these things. So in one chapter in the book, I deal with Christian history, which I think is the first step towards rectifying the wrongs that we have foisted upon all of humanity through this lens, this anti-Semitic lens that yep. has, finds its basis in our theology. That's another conversation of how that's possible. But for today, I think what I would just like to say is that if whoever's listening, if this is the first time you've ever heard the idea that Jesus is Jewish, but you're totally pro-Israel and you love <laughs> Israel, which is possible, the idea that exploring Jesus is Jewish will help us. And this is my goal. My goal is that we carve out space to allow Israel and to protect Israel to be who she's been called to be. That the nations actually surround her and allow her to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation so that they can experience all the benefits that come from following Torah that are outlined for us in Deuteronomy 20. They're all there. All these amazing things would happen. Should Israel just choose to return to her covenant obligations and follow Torah? I want to be a part of the vanguard that creates a wall around Israel that links arms with other brothers in the Lord who say, Israel, we need you to be yeah. who you've been called to be and protect her, literally physically and spiritually protect her. So that she can do that. And I think if we can do that, this is my dream. I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime. Maybe it won't. Maybe it won't. This isn't about, it's, it, it's about nothing else other than allowing Israel to be the firstborn. Allowing Israel to be the covenant partners of God. <clears throat> when we recognize Jesus is Jewish, that protective wall begins to, begins to rise. Yes, yes. Yes. And and that's that's my prayer. That's my yes. prayer. That's beautiful, man. That's that, awesome. that's that that's something that the community definitely needs, especially in our in our day and age. You know, I've been kind of shocked to hear some of the responses of what transpired on October seventh, uh, even by by many Christians. Uh I know a lot of it has to do with, you know, ignorance. You know, we can't deal with any individual as a as a whole, but um, definitely, I agree with you 100% that I think the first step is to acknowledge this uh, this big historical and religious fact that Jesus is Jewish, not just because he was born in Israel or because it's a particular people. This particular people has a particular faith, and it wasn't it wasn't Christianity as we know it. It was right. uh, Jew or Judaism of the first century to this day. This people has passed down this faith from generation to generation um, because they're a tight knit people uh, and God has kept them together. Yeah. We need to acknowledge that and that will in turn get us in contact with his brothers and sisters, which yeah. is the Jewish people. We begin to understand their background and understand that this was his people. This is who he first and foremost came and died for, right? Yep. We need to understand these things, and we need to have a, a natural love for them. Um, here, as Paul says, the custodians of the revelations of God. Yep. And 
through no other people would we had known the creator. Paul mm-hmm. says this. Okay. And we need to, we need to do our service, which is our natural services to also protect her, uh, be in service, be partners and see, see how we can do this job together of Tiku rectification. Yep. And, 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 and this is part of our job what we're doing here together. Yep. That's true. Thank, well, I appreciate that. Um, Ty and Ray and, I think we all three, Ray, you know how important this is to me, and I know that you've worked so hard to to create dialogue and create a space. Um, and it's hard when you're in certain study groups or certain, you know, some go deeper than others, and, you know, you have some out there lurking that are trying to understand. Um, but I think that what you've done, Ty, in your book is a resource that will it will challenge the academic, but it will also bring a um, a safe space, as you would put it, for those that are trying to understand and trying to get some answers to not only historical context, but what do I do with it? Yeah. So I want to thank you, Ty, so much for taking time and getting up early this morning and uh, being with us today to do this. Look forward to us continuing to have discussions like this. Ray, I appreciate you um, pulling over and stopping while we did this and not continue to drive while we were doing this because uh, if you have an accident, I'm going to feel real bad about it. Okay. (laughs) Um, But to both of you. (laughs) Yeah, guys, let's do it again. You're lucky I'm not yeah, in a yeah, patrol car. Wanted, I wanted to go ahead and promote it, man. We were, we would definitely have tie back. Uh, we'll make maybe make this like a series, and, and and we'll have particular questions or topics that we'll bring up to tie so we could uh, address these together. Sounds good, man. Yeah, sounds great. good. Well, you guys take care. Have a blessed rest of the uh, rest of the day. And for those of you out there watching, bless you and your families. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I encourage you, um, I don't, I, I'm not getting any kind of a kickback from this, but I encourage you to get a hold of Ty's book, sit down, read it twice, minimum twice, and then just ask yourself, you know, what is the truth? You know, can I understand it? And then bring questions to the comment sections as we post this. And we're just going to shut this down and we'll do this again soon. Awesome. All right. All right, fellas. Blessings. Love you guys, man. Good times. All right, right, fellas. Bye bye.